Logarithm's Netmon Freemium delivers real-time network visibility to quickly identify emerging threats in your IT environment. Netmon Freemium is a free commercial-grade network forensics and traffic analytics solution. You can use Netmon Freemium's powerful capabilities to search against all of observed network traffic, identify abnormal traffic patterns and application usage, and quickly analyze full packet captures. Take the first step towards real-time network visibility. Visit logarithm.com forward slash freemium to learn more and download it today. Welcome back, everyone, to Startup Security Weekly. This is our Startup Security News segment. We're going to talk about uh, some articles that is going to attempt to give advice to startups, and specifically <laughs> security startups. I say attempt because it doesn't always work out that way. <laughs> it's like Lucy. Yeah. We're on the peanuts. Give us a nickel. Sit down. The doctor's in. Yeah. We're going to we're gonna talk know, about a few things. <laughs> we're gonna, we'll talk about them. Uh, it's, like, it's how we covered you know, pretty much every article on the entire network. It's with a grain of salt, uh, which I think is important, obviously. And we'll talk about some... Uh, when you drink your uh, margaritas, salt is very important. Salt is very important. It can be a good uh, margarita. Good, good point. Salt... Um, Salt and pepper rim on a pickle juice martini is one of the drinks that a restaurant makes here uh, locally, which is awesome. Awesome. You know, at first, like I had to process that. It I would sounds that. disgusting, doesn't it? It's actually well, I was good. trying to debate in my head whether that's disgusting or delicious, but uh, I'll come visit one of these days, yes, I promise. Yes, it's delicious. And uh, we'll... We'll try it. That sounds really good. Yeah, you know, the thing about these stories, like as we pick them, uh, you know, especially as I'm looking at it, you know, it's kind of like in, in the world of security in specific, there's a ton of stories it's to go look at. And I, I'm pretty on the record for uh, I, I'm on a negativity fast, right? I mean, I, we took the TVs out of the house. Um, I still get the Wall Street Journal, but I, I read it less. Um, I'm not watching network news. I, I've tried to detach from a lot of that stuff. And, and I'll tell you, when you hear someone say you should go on a negativity fast and you're like, well, no, I I'll tell you what, I'm still connected. I still know what's going on in the world. I think mm -hmm. it's pretty hard these days not to. Paul, I'm reading uh, – so my other thing now is I'm reading a fiction book a week, and I'm reading a business book. And uh, and the business books, I'm reading them until they're done, and I pick up the next one. Mm -hmm. So I've always got like two books going. Holy cow. Like you, they'll tell you like if you read more, you'll write more. Yep. And that yep. if you read more, your writing will improve. Yep. And that if you take those other distractions away, you have more time with your kids, and you have better conversations, and you can read – like, yep. 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 So when I'm looking at these stories, I'm looking for things that are resonating with our experiences that we talk about, with the other companies that I'm talking about. And although some of these things may seem a little bit negative when we put them in there, what I'm trying to do is I'm always looking at it from the lens of if you are a startup, what would be useful for you to know? If you're thinking about being a startup, what would be useful for you to know? If you're in an enterprise today and you'd like to work with startups, what would be useful for you to know if you're in a startup today, or if you're in an enterprise today, but you want to operate like a startup, which by the way, you can totally do that. In fact, the more I work with people on leadership and communication in any aspects, the more I realize that the parallels are there. So, you know, I'm always trying to find those like five things that are interesting, some that are a little mm -hmm. bit lighthearted, but that are kind of useful to that. Uh, and, and it's one of the first think, ones. This Yeah, week. this one's useful. The five tough lessons? Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you the one I keep learning uh, over and over uh, is uh, undercharging. Yeah, um, I mean, they're not, I don't think they're, they're not so much tough lessons. I think that's just sensationalizing the title. Like, they're lessons, right? And yeah. they're things you need to take into consideration. And they're not always like, don't think of these all as like negative things. Like, oh, these are like five mistakes you're going to make when you do your startup. Like, no, like, think about these five things. And it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to do it differently, too, so. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And it's just like I read this list and I went, oh, yeah. And I actually shared it out and a, and a couple other business owners on uh, Facebook were like, yep, learn those lessons. Yep, had that experience once or twice. Um, and that's the thing, you know, the, the things that I'll point out that I really thought were important were, um, in fact, they all kind of connect. Trying to do too much too soon, couple that up with not uh, saying no nearly enough and mismanaging time. You know, I pointed to the board behind me a couple times. So, by the way, this is week seven. Uh, of the year. So if you're on a 12 week cycle and you spend six weeks, this week seven is when you recalibrate. I did that this week and I, I realized that what I had laid out for the quarter was more or less attainable. I've learned, I've changed, I've pivoted. But like when I sat down and said, okay, am I wholesale making changes to it? No. Here's why I'm bringing that up again. It's really helped me just thinking about it in terms of 12 weeks has absolutely helped me 
get better at saying no. People have approached me with great ideas, and, and I can both acknowledge it as a great idea. I can give them an understanding of time frame as to when I can handle it, and then I can come back to it. It's making such a difference for me, right? So I think we've talked about this a lot. There's a way to say no and not be a jerk. You, mm-hmm. you can say no, or that sounds great. I'm going to be really busy, right? And there's a difference between I'm really busy. Call me back and say, yeah, it's how you I'm say working no. yeah. on an initiative. Right. I know I need to spend six more weeks on that. I should free up. I'm traveling. Right. We're going to be InfoSec World first mm-hmm. week of April. Hey, after that, let's get back together and, and reassess. People, yep. I actually tend to find that that really kind of works. I want to so, address the undercharging. Um, I think that yeah. as a startup, you should spend some time and figure out what you're going to charge. That may not be what you're charging day one, but depending on what product or service you're offering, you have to do the calculation what you're going to charge. You also, in that calculation, have to figure out what it's going to cost you to make the product and run the business. And then, once you know your costs, set what you're going to charge and then take into account all of those things, thank you very much, that we've talked about um, You know, in, in the past 30 or whatever episode, 27 episodes, 26 episodes that we've had, right? But it's okay what we've learned from interviewing people on the show, what I've learned running my own startup, that your initial customers, you're not going to charge them your list price, right? But have your list price, okay? And don't worry about undercharging, you know, get to your list price eventually, rather quickly, actually, but make sure you set your price and realize I think that's it's a- only going to probably go up from there. I think it's a great point. I'm going to offer something that I heard from somebody a couple weeks ago. And when I heard it, it was like, ah. Oh. So a lot of us think, okay, we're going to run out with our beta and we're going to go cheaper with it. I did it this summer. I, I said, hey, you know what? Because I haven't really done this class yet. I know how to teach. I know what this material is. Let's go figure it out together. So I charged a lot less. When I got done with it, everybody went through the course said, by the way, I would have paid you like three yeah. times more. Like I was good with that. I picked a price based on what I thought people would or wouldn't do. Turned out my thinking on it, totally wrong. So in that spirit, I was on a, I don't know, a webinar somewhere, and a guy said, here's what I've learned with betas. You should charge more for the beta because they're going to get more from you. Like, mm-hmm. that's the trade-off. Like, you're going to say, look, I think I'm going to go to market with this probably around four or $5,000, whatever your number is. So I'm going to charge you $5,000 for it. People are like, wait, but it's a beta. Yeah. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to meet with you every week. We're going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And it's kind of like, you know, you're you're going to give them more. They're going to get more. They're going to help shape it. You can charge more. Now, does that always work in the enterprise? No. Does right. that, It's just, but like the point is <clears throat> too, uh, maybe it comes down to this. I think if you, to your point, if you figured out what your value is and you can go have that conversation with somebody, then you can go say, look, this is what I think the value is. What what's What's the value for you? And I think you can come to something that's fair. Uh, I'm getting much better at doing that, and uh, and yeah. I feel a lot better for so, it. And, and here's a pricing strategy that you should think about and possibly incorporate. And again, pricing is one of those things. It's it's very personal to you. It's very specific to your business. And I'm not saying you should do this all the time, but when you think of a discount, and people like discounts, and I'm not saying not to do discounts because you may be in a product space where a discount absolutely makes sense. Mm. Sometimes, though, discounts don't necessarily make sense. But what you can do is you can say, look, here's the list price for X, and here's the list price for Y, and here's the list price for Z. You know what? This first year, you're going to get maybe Y and Z for free. Maybe you're going to get Z for free. Like, that's that's just going to be included. Next year, make sure you tell them this the first time they purchase it. Like, this year, Z is free. Next year, it's going to be this price. Like, here's the list price. I like Next that. year, it's going to be idea. the list price. And, and that way, you can offer a discount without really offering a discount. Always in including more services, kind of to your original point on this, Michael, like including more services is, is where I go. Because that helps you define your value and help your customers see yet even more value. And if you can prove more value, they're going to probably pay you more money, right? Yeah, you know what? I think that's uh, wow. That's I really like that strategy, Paul. The other thing I found too is that um, we. Sorry, I, I mentioned like I'm getting more into understanding prospecting and sales and qualifying people. And, and so, just to be clear, because some of you have actually uh, reached out and we've scheduled time, we've had great conversations, and just know I, I've enjoyed them. Uh, not every conversation I have is a sales conversation. Some conversations I'm just 
it's it's good for the industry, and I'm enjoying the, the engagement and feedback, and I'm going to continue doing that. What I've learned, though, is that your price is also a signal. So if you price something too low, you're going to attract people who you maybe wouldn't attract otherwise, and and you think, oh, that's good, I'm putting revenue in. No, that's, no. that's actually not. So you know, if you understand what you do as a business, you want to charge something that's fair in the marketplace. The way I always look at it is you want them to get a 3 to 5x value return, value return, not an ROI necessarily, mm-hmm. but a value return in the first year. I mean, the world right now is all about 10x, great, make a 10x, fine, whatever, right? But think about it this way. They make a fair investment with you. You offer them a dramatic return in value. Everybody wins. So don't price it too low or you, you're, oddly enough, not going to necessarily get that value. L- let me. This is my new favorite phrase, the other one I put in. So the, the title is, Cognitive Overhead is Your Product's Overlord. Top it with these tips. Mm. And, and this is the part that – and it was Jonathan Sander. And you've met Jonathan, right? I love Jonathan. Uh, He's awesome. Yeah, so – so I love talking to Jonathan, and and he he introduced he turned me on to this, and it was like light bulb, and like for the last two weeks, all I can do is talk about cognitive load and cognitive ease and cognitive simplicity. Here's what it boils down to: How easy is your product to understand? So even with straight talk, what I realized was I, I was perhaps unintentionally making parts of it more complex than it needed to, and so I've spent the last couple of weeks like really looking at. Whoa, what do people really need? How do I make it simpler yes. to understand? How do I walk people through it? And now that I've done that, I mean, think about how many things, right? You and I were talking about this even on a show last night. You know, how many steps are there in that? Well, how many do I need to have? Can I take a step away? Does that, what, and I just, it was just kind of interesting because as I'm looking at all this, this pops up and it, it basically said right here, cognitive overhead is the number of logical connections that your brain has to make to contextualize and understand what it sees. Mm. Now think about that. If you're in a security team today, are, how easy are you making it for people to choose the secure path? If you're in a startup yep. today, how easy are you making it for somebody to say yes to what you want them to do? Or if they said yes, to enjoy the value that you just offered them? I think that um, a tip for startups along these lines uh, with the context of this article, Michael, that... Uh, as a startup, you're probably going to have a lot of conversation with the founders and with your employees in your startup about packaging, licensing, and pricing. And over the years, I've learned that simpler is better. And that is one of the more difficult challenges, I believe, into bringing a product to market is balancing that <clears throat> your your business and how are you going to make money and how are you going to provide that value with simplifying the way you package, license, and price your products and in how you bring it to market. And that is something that I went through at Tenable. They're a sponsor, but I tell you what, what they've done with Tenable IO, I think is absolutely brilliant. And it's a good friend of mine now, uh, uh, Matt, who uh, helped create all of that, right? Um, so I'm somewhat biased, but I, I think they did a fantastic job in doing that. And I think that this article underscores why that's important. Yeah, well, all right, so they've got three assumptions and realities. Let me run them by you. You tell me how they match up to your experience. Assumption one, just go ahead and make the choice for your user. Reality, involve the user in the decisions. It increases their understanding and engagement. Help your users be part of the process. That's what they want. Yeah, that's that's a slippery slope. <laughs> because sometimes you do need to make a decision for your customer, Right. And I it, and it's not every decision. Yeah, Apple proves that. Hey, how's your new MacBook Pro? But yeah. Oh, you didn't. Yeah. Oh, you oh, didn't I got a, a Linux laptop. Yeah. It's kinda, <laughs> I love my Linux laptop actually, um, but it, it it's more. I think it's more detailed than what was described. The customer may have to make usually more than one decision. You have to figure out which decision you want to make for your customer, right? Ah. And and that I, like I that. think is I that I think is the key because there are some circumstances where I'm like, that's a great point. I've seen it go like the other direction, right? Like, especially like working at Tenable, I'm like, we can't just tell the customer exactly what to do, but on the flip side, you can't give them too many choices. So I think there's so, a yeah, happy medium of which decisions you're going to make for them and which decisions you're going to allow them to make on their own. You know, I spent a lot of time now working on like constraints and that's exactly right. Like, so like you've got to pick the right constraints mm. and let them have some choice within that. The, the other part I kind of read into this was as you're trying to figure out what choices to make, get a group of people involved and, and observe them or work with them or yes. listen to them. And, and that'll help you kind of feed it. All right. Number two, uh, assumption number two 
It's best to delight your users with its first-of-kind features. Reality, be familiar. Top driver of adoption. Be familiar with your, your own products or your customers' needs or both? Yeah, what their, their point is don't keep offering new stuff that they don't understand. Give them yeah. things that they, that they want. Well, new features, right. I mean, we've talked about product management and things like that. That's a, yeah, we've been down that road, certainly. I agree. And then the, uh, the third one, diverse feature sets lead to highly engaged user base. Build for consistency, not variety. You want to form habits. I like, I like the last part of forming habits. And that can, be, that can be tricky because if you're requiring that your customers form new habits and new behaviors, that can be a difficult sell. However, I can tell you for, for a fact yeah, that is a hard it's, sell. That's a, that's a hard sell, right? But if there are habits that they're into now or things that they're doing and your product helps them do it better, more efficiently, you're kind of building on a previous habit, I, I think that's good. Uh, changing habits is, is hard. But in other words, <clears throat> put that in a security context, like our users for our startup, right? Like they're, they're looking for... They're in a habit of looking for stuff that's already compromised in their network. Well, if you can help them with that and shape their habits, then, you know, you get a win-win. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, no. And, and I actually, I think, see, and I like your, your draw on that because the way I look at it is if you want to form habits, you can't give them too many choices. Like you've got to kind of, you got to create the groove. Yeah. Um, but like, and it's like we've said before, there, there's a balancing point of, I need to be able to make this mine, but man, I, I've looked at some software recently where I'm like, I... I don't understand. Like, I don't even know where to start with this. Like, what do you know? There's too many choices, right? So there's a, there's a way to make it work. All right. I put in, um, this is one we don't need to get into. I liked it. Uh, and it's actually kind of like an open dictionary. Uh, so startup fundraising dictionary, here's the players, here's the basic technology. They called it an open guide and they asked people to go ahead and contribute. And it lays out the basic terminology, entrepreneurs, angel investors, venture capitalists, accelerators, incubators, crowdfunding platform syndicates, and lawyers. And I think it's actually great. And, uh, and it's the kind of thing that I bookmarked. So I threw it out there, but we don't need to get deep into it. I will say this is required reading if you're going to listen to the show. I like it. We should yeah. do tests. Oh, we could yeah. do tests. We could do tests and giveaways one of these days. That's right. We could. Yeah, right. absolutely felt- read that if you're if you're tuning into the show or... Uh, a, a new listener, absolutely go read that article. I felt bad we hadn't brought up Shark Tank in a while. Got to bring um, up Shark but actually, Tank. Actually, what's cool, so I've, the headline's here. If you're listening, if you haven't read the headline yet, how much do you think an appearance on Shark Tank is worth? P- Paul, prior to reading this, what would you have thought it was worth? Um, I would say my guess would be at least a 40% increase in sales. It turns out uh, that could, that could be really good. Like they they give a couple like you know the unicorn numbers, but yeah, here you go. I mean to put dollar amounts on it is kind of unfair. <clears throat> if I'm my just going to go ahead. As a dollar or my product is a hundred thousand dollars, my how much I've made from my appearance on Shark Tank is irrelevant. It's what what is my increase in sales is the better measurement. I, I think you're right. So here, here's the interesting thing. Um, I'm going to quote from the article. When I was on set at the studio with many other entrepreneurs, the producers told us that an appearance on Shark Tank is worth approximately $9 million in marketing spend. In other words, if a third-party company wanted to pay ABC for a 10-minute commercial for its business during primetime television, it would have to pay about $9 million. I actually think that's a fair comparison, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, right? I, I mean, it's so... I do. I do. So then here's something I'm going to say, and it's going to sound a little harsh. If you're on Shark Tank, it, how, can, how the hell can you get on Shark Tank now and not know your freaking numbers, yeah. not know your ask, not know your exit, not know the audience that you serve, not, not <laughs> well, like, because oh, maybe my goodness. If you don't know those things, you may still see an increase in sales because people just like your product. You're the investors yeah. may even like your product, and if the uh, return on your appearance is based on – your product, then if you don't know your numbers, the only the investors care about that. If you're not really interested in investment or you are, but if you don't get it, it's not a big deal. You still got the exposure. You're still going to see that 40% increase in sales. So it's a win-win. I don't think that uh, should be your strategy. Just so you know, I think you absolutely should know your numbers. And if you're there, you absolutely should be seeking funding because I think that's kind of devious just to go on Shark Tank and be like, yeah, I'm probably not going to get funding, but I really just want the free advertising. I think that's kind of do. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to a certain extent, 
they they probably try to weed that out. I, I'll yeah. tell you this: if, if I see you and, and you look like an adult, I don't bother looking it up. But but there are definitely times I'm I'm listening to somebody pitch and I'm like, wow, you got your pitch down, and and that's a cool problem. It's not my problem, but let me go take a look at that. And I go look at it, and I'm like, oh, that's that's a neat company. And and I and sometimes I'm kind of curious to see how they do or how it works. So I just I thought that was interesting because you know their bottom line here, and again, and I, and I like this, and I got to tell you, I, I'll put it in my own thought. Business owners who refuse to go on Shark Tank because they can fund their own businesses are too narrow-minded to see the real value of Shark Tank. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I haven't ever considered, you know, auditioning for it myself. Maybe I'm narrow-minded. I will tell you this. Um, had a good conversation with um, somebody at a, a large company uh, the other day that works with startups. And he told me the biggest challenge he still faces is that people are sitting down with him. And, and when I say big company, I mean household name company. People sitting down across the table from me, he says, Michael... Uh, biggest challenge to see with startups, they still can't tell me the problem they solve, but they, but more importantly, they can't help me understand what they're going to do for me. They they don't talk honestly with me about what they're good at, where their potential risks are, and what we can do together to mitigate those risks. And and you know, he kind of went on and on. And um, it, but the other thing he said is they don't they don't know what they want. So he's like, I'm big enough, I can write them a check. So yeah. if I say to them, okay, are you looking for me to be a client? Are you looking for me to be an investor? Are you looking for me to be a partner? Are you looking for me to buy out? He's like, Michael, when I asked that, he goes, you wouldn't believe how many just look at me and say, uh, I'm not sure. Well, let me, and, let and me flip this on, a, on its head, Michael. And I'm going to I'm gonna do, take a shot across the bow right at your what problem are you trying to solve because it's a Shark Tank it. product, right? So help me out here. Now, I was watching Shark Tank. And uh, so then my question to you before I get into that is, do you have a problem like opening beer bottles? Like, is that a... Do you, a problem is there a recognizable problem opening beer bottles. You probably have a bottle opener, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I right. Didn't, or, I didn't. I didn't know I had a problem. Maybe I have a problem. Tell me about my problem. So there's this company. Then they're like, well, it's a 50 caliber um, uh, casing with a bullet on it, and then there's a notch in it to open your beer, right? And I'm like, well, I don't really have a problem opening beer, but like, I want that. That's kind of cool. And my wife actually found it and gave it to me for Christmas. And I was like, I got lots of bottle openers, but this one's really cool. Now, the big thing is, when I broke it out at various parties we had at our house since I got this device, I'm like, you want to open, like, I was thinking of no other bottle opener than the 50 caliber cartridge that you could use that was on Shark Tank that you could use to open your beer bottle. And everyone that I handed that to was like, wow, that's so cool. That is just so cool. I'm like, yeah, huh? Like, that's awesome, right? There's no problem in solving. <laughs> maybe my sure it is. Maybe maybe there is. Maybe it's my you wanna, just coolness you wanna, factor. Or I don't know. Well, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, you know, I'm trying not to be flippant, but like the problem that they're trying to solve is 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 there a conversation starter way to open a, a bottle of beer? Is there something you can do right now? Is it a big problem? No. I mean, like, you know, like, is it a legitimate? My world needs to be better because of it. Problem? No. But the it, conversation it, but, is also around the fact that they were on Shark Tank is a huge part of their story. Like, oh, I saw this on Shark Tank, and my wife gifted it to me for Christmas. Like, that's a huge point. part of their story now, and just also kind of speaks to the value that's pointed out uh, in the story. So there I love go. my fifty caliber bottle opener. I think it's awesome. Well, yeah, Everyone and I think, the, I think the moral of the story is, uh, given a chance to do something like this, go for it. And mm. But just but also know your exit. I mean, like, you know, because I've had people look at me and I'll be like, you ever think about taking funding? And when I was new at this, my answer was like, no, why would I do that? My answer now is I'm open to anything. Yeah, I'm not actively seeking it. It's not the position or situation I'm in. But, you know, at this stage of the game, I mean, you know, Mark Cuban is never going to come call me, but but if I got a chance and Cuban's like, dude, I like this stuff you're doing. I think I could help you be bigger. Hey, you know that's that's what I, I wouldn't I said say to no my, to that. That's what I said to my wife when she's like, "Would you want one of those bottle openers?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm open to anything." There you go. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh. Right. So because we seem to be on a 24, I, I know that's that's good. Uh, we're on a 24 hour I'm cycle at my here. Own jokes, okay? It's good. I'm laughing on the inside. You can see it. <laughs> All right. Here, here, here's the the question, uh, and I, you know, I almost don't want to talk about it. But here, here's what it is. Uh, so IoT is on the rise. One of the places we're seeing IoT on the rise is home security stuff. Uh, I don't want to dissect it because what what I kind of looked at was it it has 
it lists out the acquisitions. It lists out the the cost effectiveness of surveillance. That's something we've talked about both on the program and, and offline. And then it said, oh, but now there's this need to secure the home devices. So they kind of said, you know, wait a minute, uh, this thing could actually backfire and work against you. Now, I know we've talked about that as well. Here's, I guess, my question when I look at it from a startup perspective. Doesn't that create the opportunity? Like, maybe this is how IoT starts to get better, right? Maybe this is how IoT starts to look at security because we're going to do it in things that people understand. They're, they're, they're doorbells that check for things. There's surveillance cameras and other stuff that we start looking at security there. They get it. Like, I'm looking at this the other way going, oh, not, not, we're totally screwed. I'm going, whoa. Maybe this is – if we're changing how people think about home security, maybe we can change how they think about IoT security at the same time. No, I, I, I agree. Optimistic. I think that there's technology that we call IoT devices that are <clears throat> targeted at improving your security. And then if people are interested in improving their security, they realize that there's cyber stuff that they need to do in the vein of security, and they need to secure their other IoT device. I, I think it's a logical kind of thing, right? And I think it helps – Overall, raise awareness. Ring is a prime example, right? Um, I don't think it's reached the masses, but those of us in security, security professionals, kind of know, most of us know the story, right? Ring had a heinous, pretty heinous vulnerability. I mean, I wouldn't call it heinous. They had a vulnerability. And they fixed it, and they pushed it out to all their devices, right? And so these security devices can serve as a model and raise awareness that yeah. it, it users... I think eventually they're going to be like, well, I got a ring. It provides me security. And by the way, like I, I didn't have to worry about the security of the device. Why do I have to worry about it on my other devices? And it's going to raise the bar. Yeah, like I, I you know, I, that, and I think that's where we get, uh, you know, where I hope we get to play an opportunity. In fact, maybe we can get somebody from Ring on the show talk about some of this from their perspective. We and, should. And I learned. can. I can. I, we'll work. We'll okay. Talk, we'll talk after. All this. right. So, uh, so that's the big stuff I had. Let me let me run some names by you because I know we're running tight on time here. Uh, so, uh, and there's more. I just cherry picked a couple for this week, and and now we just got done with RSA. Which, if you're watching this and you're not part of the security industry, it's pretty much the it's the big security show every year. So, a lot of people the big time vendor, their, the big vendor show, commercial. Fair show. point. Yeah. So, people time a lot of their announcements around this, and this is like a lot of awards. Like I've, everybody and their brothers won an award, not to diminish from ours. I'm just saying uh, <laughs> it is, when, that you know, like so I, I got a lot of it's press so releases. About you know, so everybody's now a winner Everyone's of something. Got an award of some kind, yeah, re- relative to. All right, so Sofo, Sophos acquired Invincia, hundred million dollars. Invincia Endpoint Security. Um, surprise, not a surprise. I didn't. I know a little bit about Sophos. I don't know. I didn't know a lot about Invincia. Um, well, I think a boy, I think it's AV companies just trying to catch up. Um, a hundred well, okay, million. A so- hundred million actually. If their product really works, is actually a pretty good deal. To be it's honest a, it's with a, you, it's a good price. Well, I'll yeah. tell you something I think is interesting about what you just said. Um, think about talking with Eddie Bobritsky. You know, like he, he, one of the points that he's made, or that maybe he and I've talked about, was something along the lines of, you know, Michael, these 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 big companies are going to catch up. Like mm-hmm. if there's stuff that's good and it's working, they're going to do it. What if you want to look at it from a startup perspective? If you're an enterprise today, you can have R and D on your books, or somebody else can have it on their books, and you can meet with these companies, find the ones you like, and you can acquire them. Mm-hmm. The big companies are going to keep doing this. So um, this other one I thought was interesting. Capsule Eight raised two and a half million dollars in a seed round. Wow. This place, this market is all over the place, um, but that's that's big. So they develop container aware, real time threat protection platform for cloud on premise and hybrid environments. Well, yeah, and you know why companies that <coughs> excuse me that are doing uh, stuff with containers, DevOps, and cloud management in some capacity. Uh, one of the <clears throat> the like compelling statistics why I think there's money flowing into these companies, Michael, is Gartner predicts that five percent of companies today are using some kind of cloud access. Uh... Platform, right? They predict that in I think five years, that's going to grow to eighty five percent. It it really and okay, so that's the Gartner statistic that kind of backs up what we're all saying in the industry is. Everyone's moving to cloud. Everyone's going to need security in cloud. So therefore, the companies that are on the bleeding edge of that, they're getting funding. They're growing in adoption. They have huge projections. They have huge valuations. And somewhat rightfully so, because that is an emerging market in security. All right. So that's, and that's, you know, it's interesting to, that you say that. So if you can come at somebody, come at them sounds wrong. If you can make your case to an investor that, hey, look, 
uh, industry analysts like Gartner have done this, this, and this. This is the space we play in. This yeah. is the growth. Like, and and then and then you and I gotta I gotta think with a two and a half million dollar seed round, you're probably saying, look, speed is of the essence. I gotta build up the team. I gotta get the platform. I gotta do the marketing. Right? Like, it, I gotta do all actually, of it. It's actually it's actually kind of it's actually kind of low to do yeah like, to do it at, at speed. It's actually kind of low. So. so I'm going to try to remember this, and I'm following them now on Owler. Uh, I'm going to be curious to see how long till they get to their Series A. This might be one where they've got a Series A this fall. Yeah. Of uh, my my guess would be based on a two and a half million dollar seed round. I wouldn't be shocked if we saw a ten to fifteen million dollar Series A. Uh, plus, I, I got to check them real quick. I, I want to say before I say it, let me just check. They were backed by a name that we know um, that we see making plays in this space a lot. It's coming up real quick here. Um, yeah, Bessemer. Mm-hmm. They were they were yep. backed by Bessemer. So, yeah, th- and we know that they make a lot of big A, a bets. So we'll see where that goes. Other one, only because we I brought it up because we talked about it the other day. Imperva acquired Camouflage. I did it my spelling, not their not their really unique way of spelling it. But we've been talking about masking and shifting and different ways of looking at stuff. Uh, and Imperva acquired them. It was an undisclosed amount, uh, which is not terribly surprising to me. What do you make of that? Uh, what is can is an end and intelligent data masking platform uh, discovery class and something masking? I I don't know. I think Imperv is all over the place. Dude. I, I think they're. Yeah, I was going to ask your question on that too because I was kind of like, it's an. I got to be fair. It's a name that I that I hear a lot, but I don't really know what they do. And right. and I'm and, looking and, at well, it. And there was a story from they last night. They protect high Michael. value applications and data from theft, insider abuse, and fraud. Cool. What I, and I, what I don't see with Imperva, and maybe I need to delve into a little more, is a unification of their platform. I think they probably could be a pretty strong player, especially in the mid-market, if they were to tie some of their products together. For example, they have a free database vulnerability scanning tool. It checks for like 2,500 uh, different database vulnerabilities. And oh, cool. if they can couple it with that platform and then have their web application uh, firewall technology be in the front, if they could... like put all that together, especially, like I said, for SMB and mid-market, they'd have a winner. I think their technologies are too disparate at this time uh, for them to be really, truly successful in any single vertical. Yeah, by that. Okay, that makes sense. And um, and, it, and now that I'm understanding a little bit more about what they do, that, that getting a data masking thing kind of makes sense. I'll be curious to see, to your point, their integration. But anyway, this is the thing I've been learning too, working with more people on, on straight talk. It's, it's all about execution, right? Like there's a, what I've been figuring out is, is a, in fact, right. Those are the biggies for the week. Um, the growth I've had just in the last week, Paul has been phenomenal. And it kind of relates back to a lot of this stuff. Action will always trump perfection. And there's a phrase that I've that I've read my whole life, and I never understood it till about a week ago, which was, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. Uh, yeah, just get out there and do it. And I'll, t- I'll tell you what, I've had some absolutely great conversations in the last week. And the way I've been explaining stuff, even two weeks ago, here's my big change. Right, so we talk about cognitive ease and cognitive load. When, when you're looking at something like straight talk, I, I was really stuck trying to figure out what the opposite of straight talk is. Funny, I was stuck. The opposite of straight talk is when you're stuck. It's when there's so much friction that's creeped in that you're stuck and you're not going anywhere and, and think bad things are happening as a result. Once I started talking about being stuck and helping people get their projects unstuck, uh, yeah, uh, I'm in a really exciting place right now. Like, you know, like you do that one thing and suddenly you're like, oh, I get it. And it connects to this, and it connects to this, and I can put the. So that's kind of where I've been in terms of my own startup journey. But what it's really done too is it's forced me having all these conversations has been. I, you know, those of you who have engaged with me, thank you so much because you've really helped me understand the stuff I'm explaining well, and being able to give you voice to some of the challenges that we face. But then it's also helping me go back and think about it and recalibrate some of this stuff and be be more consistent with it. Paul, I'm seeing the world differently as a result. So you know. Listen, if if you're out there and you're trying to do startups, I, I love it. I mean, I know this isn't for everybody, but sometimes the the things that, the problems we can solve and the things we can do are just so exciting. And I do hope that you're getting some of that. So if you if you've got things you want to share, you're excited, shoot them into us and let us know and let us know the stuff that's up because that'll be a blast. And and how are things going for you guys? So it's kind of funny. One of the revelations we've had recently is our, our developers came up with a new release. And they're like, okay, this is a new release. You guys test it and, and find bugs in it and tell us what's wrong. As opposed to previous releases where they're like, this release is ready to go. They don't say that anymore. <laughs> and I think it just takes time to build a rapport with your team uh, and understand you know, that John and I are a, a lot 
uh, we're old now and we've been around <laughs> and we're kind of curmudgeon especially when it comes to software. Uh, so this release, they were like, yeah, test it and find all the problems that you guys always find in, in issues. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of fun being your own QA department uh, in, in creating something like that and seeing the progression of your developers to uh, understand uh, some of the realities of creating software. So. Yeah, you know, too, that speaks to Paul. It sounds like then you guys are doing, you and John both doing a good job of mentoring. I, I loved having John on the program last week. Uh, I like it when the three of us get together and, and get to have some of those conversations. Well, you guys have. A lot of that uh, is John tries to keep some distance between me and the developers because I tend to be like, <laughs> I'm way more of a dick than John is when it comes to developers. <laughs> like you. Working under me writing software, like you're gonna, you, you, you're gonna, you're gonna probably hate me a, um, some of the time, some of the time, some of the time. Uh, so he tries to <laughs> keep the reins in on me and only use me when, when absolutely necessary. And that largely stems from the fact that I was learning to write software at a software company, and my mentors were very hard on me, and I to this day appreciate that and. Yep. love the fact that they did that because it makes you a better software developer it makes you a better Absolutely. person in your career uh to have people like that uh you know when they tear things apart i mean that's how you learn you know and they and they did it in a it's not I shouldn't say being a dick right it's being stern right and, yeah. and setting rules and um you know sometimes i think oftentimes people benefit from just being hard on them like that and i think that when you're creating software for a startup, that's uh, that's a good place to do that, right? Well, and as you're pointing out, right, there's a distinction between being a jerk because you can yeah. and helping somebody achieve better because they can. Yes, and, exactly. And I don't think you should ever have shame for setting a high bar for a company and then hiring people that you can mentor to clear the bar. Everybody's better for that. And that's why I said, like, so those are the things to me now that when you talk about that, I'm like, that's that's awesome. And you like, find I, people that I are get teachable, it. I like too. That. Like, I interviewed for my first computer job and the person interviewing me was like all right go solve this problem and write it in code on the board right and i wasn't 100 percent right but thankfully he saw some potential <laughs> in what i wrote on the board uh and, and that's you know why i got the job and why i was uh had the luxury of working with other people who had been doing it longer and they taught me so um you know that's that's really cool now to be in the uh, a different position today where, where funny I how we got people. old yeah we got it, old it doesn't right? doesn't always feel that way right but you know it's it's uh uh probably this is where where at least for me i'll shut up after this i i once remarked to somebody like you know when we were younger at least when i was younger i'd listen to the guys our age uh say stuff and i'd be like you don't know any better blah 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 now i'm their age and i'm like they totally knew and, and but what i've come to realize is that's how it's supposed to be like when we're when we're in our 20s we're supposed to think about it and attack it differently and if you're watching us and you're younger do go for it we might not know anything prove us wrong kick ass by the way, when you're RH, you'll be better for it. Like, go do it. Don't don't take the safe route. Do it. Go go swing for the fences. Kick ass. Because oh, yeah. if you I mean, can I do I that, was crapping my pants in the interview. I'm like, there's no way I can do this, yeah. but I'm gonna try. Damn it, because I don't know if I'm gonna be successful if I don't try. So, yeah. No, I so I just I I like the experience that we get that you can only get by living and having the experience, right? I mean, it's, it's a good thing. What's cool is we can share it with other people. And I dig that a lot. So absolutely. Well, Life thanks good, everyone man. for watching startup security weekly. That concludes this episode. We'll see everyone next week.